Hey, good morning, church. Thank you once again for tuning in to this week's live stream. We're so glad that you're here. And hey, if you didn't hear earlier, I am so excited. Tonight, we're gathering in person. We're going to be socially distanced. We're going to be masked up. Um, but we're gathering at Valley Christian right across from Wood Middle School. We're going to do some worship together. We're going to receive communion together, share a little bit from the word briefly, um, and just really lift one another up in prayer. And so if you feel comfortable coming out and joining us, we would love to see you as we gather in person together um, tonight, Sunday night, Valley at 5 p.m. Um, I hope to see you there. I think it's going to be a beautiful time in the presence of God. Uh, today, we're going to continue our series on dominion. We're actually on part eight, but we're going to kind of go to another chapter of this series. We're maybe the third chapter, you could call it part eight, but the third chapter. Um, and in this, this chapter, we want to talk about theological understanding, theological understanding. Now, the word theology means essentially the study of God, right? So theology is from two words, theos meaning God and logos meaning the word of God. And so theology is the pursuit of the mind of God as it is revealed in scripture, the pursuit of the mind of God as it is revealed in the scripture. And theology's primary purpose, catch this, theology's primary purpose is to know God. See, it's important because how we think about God is going to shape how we engage with God and also how we work with God in this world or this community that he's placed us in. So it's important that we think rightly about the things of God. And that's what theology is all about. It's not for some uh, academic program at a Bible college. It's not for just theologians and, and Bible teachers and scholars and pastors. It's about every single one of us beginning to function and think rightly about God um, so that we may know God. St. Augustine said it like this in regards to theology and the scriptures. He said, treat the scripture of God as the face of God. And he, he finalizes that statement by saying, melt in its presence. Treat the scripture of God as the face of God and melt in its presence. So the scripture of God, as we know, is the Bible. The Bible is the scripture of God. And the Bible is a collection of books, right? All of these books inspired by God. And we're going to talk more about this inspiration of God in writing the text here in a minute. But the Bible is a collection of books inspired by God, written by 40 plus authors um, from all walks of lives. We're talking about shepherds. We're talking about fishermen. We're talking about kings. We're talking about men um, from all different walks of lives um, over a 1500 year span of time in writing these collection of books. There are 66 different books of the Bible. There are 39 books in the Old Testament. There are 27 books in the New Testament. The Old Testament is about the Old Covenant and the New Testament is about the New Covenant in Jesus. So 39 and 27, there are 1,189 chapters in the Bible and there were 31,102 verses in the Bible. I'm sure that that can fluctuate depending upon the different version of Bible you use, but you get the picture. And the Bible in particular is written in sort of seven types of genres. There might be more, there might be less, but I, I lined out seven genres of writing, meaning the Bible is not written the same all the way through. Every single book is not written in the same sort of genre, the same sort of style of writing. So we have books of law, we have elements of history, wisdom, poetry, narrative, epistles, which are letters, prophecy, and apocalyptic writings. So the Bible is filled with different, this collection of books that are filled with different genres of writing written over 40, uh, excuse me, over 1,500 years of time by 40 different authors. So this is a pretty complex collection of books that we call the Bible. And I want to say from the start here, it's really important that we understand that we do not worship the Bible. No, the Bible introduces us to the one we worship, 
which is Jesus. And it's important to make that distinction. We do not worship the Bible. The Bible is what introduces us to the one that we worship, and the one that we worship is Jesus. Now, in regards, in regards to this collection of 66 different books, I was thinking about it in regards to maybe a puzzle. How many out there have put together a puzzle before? I know some people really enjoy it. I, I think it's fun for the first couple of minutes and then I'm out. But uh, I brought in some, sort of this puzzle up here. This is a puzzle of Noah's Ark. Uh, very spiritual, of course. 500-piece um, puzzle of Noah's Ark. And one of the first things that you do when you're putting together a puzzle is that you set up the box so that you can see the picture. Now, interestingly, this, this box came with its own like little mini poster picture. So you set up the box so that you can see the picture. And then what do you do? You begin to search through the box to find the corner pieces, right? The four corners. We get the corner piece first, get all four corners set out. Then we look for the edges, right? We line out all the edges. See the edge piece? There are only three sides of the edges. We line out all the edges to the corners. And then finally, we fill in all the middle pieces that have all the different colors and elements to the puzzle. But here's the deal. The picture on the box, or in this case, on this particular like poster, the picture on the box is super critical because the picture on the box gives us the grand view of the finished work. Like, I don't know about you, but it would be foolish to pour out all the pieces of the puzzle on the table with no image of what the, the grand finished work looks like and then try to put the puzzle pieces together. You have no imagery in your mind of what is this supposed to look like when it's done. In the same way, we would be foolish to think that one piece of this puzzle has the ability to define or explain the entirety of the puzzle. And so it is with the 66 piece, if you will, or 1,189 piece, or maybe you'd like the 31,102 piece puzzle called Scripture. See, Scripture is a collection of books and in those books, there's a collection now of chapters and verses. And it would be foolish for us to t gather just one verse or one chapter or one book and pull it out of all of the rest of the chapters and verses and books and claim that that one piece held the grand view of the whole. Because it doesn't. Now, every single verse fits into every single chapter that forms every single book to give us a grand view of the finished work of, listen to me here, the finished work of Jesus. Jesus is the grand picture of Scripture. When we go to the Bible, and just like a puzzle, if we set up the imagery, what is the grand view of this finished work? When we go to the Bible, we must always remember that the grand view of the finished work of Scripture is Jesus and Jesus alone. All Scripture is pointing either ahead to Jesus or in the moment when Jesus walked the earth or forward to when Jesus comes again. All scripture. Jesus is the grand view of all scripture. Again, Augustine said it like this. The new is in the old concealed and the old is in the new revealed. He's saying basically that the New Testament is concealed in the Old Testament. The, the prophetic um, declarations that Jesus would come, they're concealed. Maybe people don't fully understand that, but it's there in the Old Testament pointing to when Jesus would come. And all of the old is now revealed in the New Testament. All of those prophecies when Jesus shows up begins to come to life in the 27 books of the New Testament. So I want to look at a little bit of text from a letter that Paul wrote to Timothy. It's actually 2 Timothy. It's the second letter that he wrote, but First of all, let me, before we read that little bit of text, let me share a little bit about Paul and Timothy's relationship. Paul is basically Timothy's spiritual father, meaning that he um, probably helped him come into the faith and then he helped him grow in his faith. 
And when Paul wrote this second um, letter to Timothy, Paul is imprisoned in Rome and he believes that the end is near. Paul has been in prison multiple times throughout his uh, journey as a Christ follower, but he believes that this is probably the last time that he will be in prison. Indeed, that he will more than likely lose his life in prison. And so this is Paul's final and most personal letter that he sends out. And the big idea of 2 Timothy is this, is that Timothy should continue to preach and teach the word of God and that he should raise up faithful leaders who will also contend to faithfully declare the storyline of all of the text. That storyline being this, Christ incarnate, crucified, resurrected, ascended, and coming again. Because Jesus is the grand picture of Scripture. So 2 Timothy chapter 2, uh, we're going to go verse 15 and then chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Remember, this is a letter, and I would encourage you to go read the letter all the way through. It won't take you very long. But here's what it says. Verse 15 of chapter 2 says this, Timothy, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth or rightly dividing scripture. In chapter three, verses, let's see here, uh, 16 to 17, he goes on to say, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So we see that Paul is encouraging Timothy here, that he needs to study the word, that he needs to be a man of theology, that he needs to study God so that um, so that he can um, be a worker who does not need to be ashamed. It is meaning that he's not shamed in public because of, of improperly um, understanding Scripture, but that he can rightly divide or rightly handle the word of truth. And it's important that you rightly handle it because he goes on to say that all Scripture is God-breathed or inspired by God, that God inspired the 40-plus authors to write the things that God wanted them to write, and therefore it is anointed by, inspired by, breathed out by God, by His Spirit through these authors, and that this scripture is profitable for so many things, ultimately equipping and completing men and women of God for every good work, the work of the ministry. So you follow what I'm seeing here. The Bible is extraordinary. It is an extraordinary collection of books, but listen to me. The Bible is not extraordinary because of its mystery. Paul is telling Timothy here that you can divide, you can search the scriptures, you can part them out and recognize the truth that is in those scriptures. So it's not extraordinary because of its mystery. No, the Bible is extraordinary because of its accessibility and because of its vulnerability because it's accessible to you and me and everyone else, and because it's truthful, it's honest, it's authentic, it's vulnerable. It doesn't just tell us the good things. It tells us all the things. And that's what's important when we read Scripture. So as we begin to think about how we think about Scripture, how do we study God, we've got to ask ourselves this question, what should our approach to Scripture be? Or what kind of book is this collection of books? Is it a textbook? A book filled with information and instruction that we memorize. Maybe you've heard it before, like the old acronym of Bible stands for basic instructions before leaving earth. No, it's not an, a textbook. Yes, you can find instruction. Yes, you can find information, but primarily it's not a textbook. Is it a cookbook? which seems silly, I know. But you know, this idea that it's full of formulas and recipes, and if we follow these recipes and formulas, then voila, we'll end up with this beautiful creation. 
but it's not primarily a cookbook. Is it a coffee table book full of nuggets of inspiration? I've had lots of friends over the years that they look to the Bible for nuggets. They would even call them golden nuggets of inspiration. Is it an inspiration book, a coffee? Just flip it open at any time and draw a little inspiration. Though the Bible is filled with inspirational text, it is not primarily a coffee table book of golden nuggets of inspiration. Is it, I like this one, is it a magic book? Is the Bible full of incantations and declarations that if we just recite this verse or declare that verse, that it will magically change circumstances and situations, that it will radically shift environments and the things that are happening around us? No, God, no, it is not a magic book. It is not intended to be used as incantations and declarations. Is it a rule book? This, I think, is sometimes how many of us get hung up, that the Bible is a rule book, that it is full of moral codes and ethics that we must follow, that it is prescribing on every single page the way in which we should live. And though the Bible is full of moral uh, codes and ethical ways in which we should live, it is not primarily a rule book. So then what is, or what type of book is this Bible? I would say that the Bible is a grand storybook. It is a grand narrative. It is a narrative about God and his world, or God at work in his world through his own particular people, not perfect people, particular people. And so I just want to lay out real quick, and I'm going to move through this quickly, real quick, the Bible as a grand narrative in a grand view of five acts. Act one is creation. In Genesis chapter 1 and 2, we see that the scene of Scripture opens in epic fashion and we are introduced to the main characters, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit, working together to shape the world. They are speaking with authority, creating breathless majesty, collecting the seas and scattering the stars, establishing the boundaries of day and night, creating the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, and the beasts of the fields. And then they say to themselves, let us make man in our own image. This is the climax of creation, the climax of the opening scene, the introduction of another character, man and woman. And man becomes a speaking spirit and man and women are entrusted with the abundance of the garden and indeed the abundance of the world. And in this moment, this first scene, everything was good, really good blessed even until it wasn't. Because scene two comes rushing in. We know it as the fall. It's Genesis chapter three. Immediately the mood changes. A new character is introduced. A serpent, metaphorical or otherwise, he, she, it is cunning and conniving. Did God say the servant, the serpent, Asked, did God actually say the serpent craftily challenges God's command that you should eat every tree in the garden, but do not eat of this one tree? And says, did God say a master of manipulation? Adam and Eve begin to reason with the serpent. They reason with themselves. They are tempted. They eat. They are naked. They are ashamed. They hide and they are banished from the garden. And all that was right, all that was good, all that was perfect had now become unimaginably broken and hopeless. 
And now the trajectory of humanity bends toward rebellion and sin. We have Cain and Abel. We have Noah and the flood. We have King Nimrod and the Tower of Babel. Nothing seems to be going as it should. Everything is broken. Everything is rebellious. And then we move slowly into Act 3. And in Act 3, God begins to introduce us to his own people. As devastating as the fall is, God is not done with his good creation. He seeks to redeem and restore. Why? Because God's nature is a compassionate and gracious God. It begins to come into view that he is compassionate and gracious as he seeks to establish a people of his own, as he seeks redemption, as he seeks restoration. So God calls Abram and Sarai or Abraham and Sarah and he strikes a covenant with them. He says, all nations will be blessed through you, Abraham. And God then becomes the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, a God of generations, slowly but surely working long obedience in the same direction towards blessing all nations through Abraham. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob later becoming Israel. Israel is God's own special people, 12 tribes of Israel. Liberated from Egyptian captivity on the night of Passover. Brought to the Mount Sinai through the Red Sea. Given laws, a temple, a place to worship. Wandering in the desert for 40 years. Conquest and prophets and kings. This act of Israel, this whole middle section of the Old Testament. It shows us the up and down, mountains and valleys, obedience and rebellion, uh, rebellious nature of God's people. That though God is trying to graciously cut covenant with us, God is trying to graciously restore us and redeem us, we often find ourselves rebelling against God, that we are horrible law keepers, that we are horrible when it comes to obedience, and God is still working. So it shows us the, the mountains and the valleys, the obedient and rebellious nature of God's people. But it also, this third act shows us the patient, long-suffering, gracious nature of God. And then silence. Act four breaks onto the scene through the Gospels the apex of the storyline, the pinnacle of the storyline. It's Christ. 400 years of silence breaks with an angelic announcement to a poor virgin girl, Mary. You will bear a child and you shall call him Emmanuel, God with us. The prophets were right. A new king and a new kingdom has now been inaugurated. Baptism, temptation, ministry, miracles, the Sermon on the Mount. This is the life of Jesus that slowly for three and a half years walking the streets of Jerusalem, ministering to the people, declaring the kingdom of heaven is at hand, moves from the miracles and the sermons on the mount to the moment when he rode into Jerusalem and the cries began to become crucify him, crucify him, crucify him to the cross, to his death and the grave and darkness and hopelessness, except on the third day, the earth shook again. The stone was rolled away, and resurrection power raised Jesus from the dead. And Jesus, for 40 days and 40 nights, meets with his disciples. He gives them the great commission, go therefore into all the world to preach the gospel to all creation, making disciples of all men. And then he ascends to heaven and he tells them, go to Jerusalem and wait. And final, grand story, 
the fifth act is the church, the new creation, God's new special people. They go to the upper room and they wait in anticipation, 120 of them, men and women alike. These are disciples and followers of Jesus uh, who are waiting for this promise and wind and fire and an uproar of tongues shakes the room that they're in. All kinds of tongues declaring the glory of Jesus. And drunk, but not drunk as you would suppose. Drunk on the spirit. They pour out into the streets and Peter preaches to all of the masses about Christ crucified, resurrected and ascended. And 3,000 people are saved. And in that moment, the church is born. A new people are born. A new Israel is born. God's new, special, chosen people. This is God's people now with God dwelling in them. Declaring the kingdom way of Jesus. The way of self-sacrificial love for God, neighbor, and enemy. It breaks forth into missionary journeys. It breaks forth into the, to the planting and flourishing of churches. It breaks forth into the writing of the epistles like what we read earlier. It breaks forth into deep theological ideas and understanding. This is who God is. This is how we should think about God. And Paul contends with Timothy to continue to fight to study this theology, this storyline of scripture, do not lose it, that it is a grand narrative of Jesus, incarnate, crucified, resurrected, ascended, and coming again. When we begin to think about what scripture says, we must understand that all of scripture paints for us a grand narrative of Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful for your word, alive and active. The scriptures say it's alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. Lord, we pray that your word would come to life in us. And as we begin to think about how we should think about your word, may we see the storyline that you are continually trying to tell that has gone beyond just what the text says, but even now into our own lives, you are still moving and working in and through us. May we yield to the storyline of Jesus, incarnate, crucified, resurrected, ascended, and coming again. In Jesus' name, amen. Before you go, let me pray this blessing over you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. God bless you. We'll see you next week.